And uh, welcome everyone for another uh, Monday series of our Let's Talk About Regulation. This is actually the last time that I'm going to post this session. And we decided to uh, introduce to our speaker today. Um, we announced uh, Jean-Claude, but sadly he had a last minute travel uh, due to work. Uh, but he, uh, his colleague Cecilia, who is the senior manager at PwC and an expert on topics, is going to join us. So I'm going to give a little bit of overview of who Cecilia is, and then I'm going to hand over to her. As always, you can always make questions on the chat or at the end of the session. So. Cecilia focus on financial markets and, ba and banking regulation and has like over 15 years of experience as a licensed lawyer. And she has this extensive knowledge, so prepare all your questions about these topics on corporate law, merchant ac acquisitions and contracts. And she also helps asset managers, investor funds, pension funds, and security firms and banks in Switzerland as well in other countries. And she supports them mostly in obtaining authorizations and licenses as well as other uh, legal topics they might face. Uh, she's, of course, uh, um, a lawyer graduated from the University of Geneva, has a master's degree in banking and financial, and financial law from the Boston University, and she's also a member of the bar at the Canton of Geneva. So without further ado, I will hand over to you. And again, thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for everyone who's here uh, during the holiday season for the one based in Europe and uh, North. <laughs> so um, let's start maybe right away with the presentation and I will present you. Yeah, thank you for the agenda, uh, Mariana. So I will start with a short overview of the DLT, uh, DLT meaning um, uh, the DLT sector in Switzerland, then the specificities of the Swiss legal framework, and then uh, how do we work with our financial uh, market supervisory authority that is called FINMA, and then we'll do some conclusions. So maybe uh, what I will do is that I will stop uh, after each uh, section of the agenda. If you have any questions, uh, like... Uh, Mariana mentioned it, just uh, maybe you can raise your voice or send a message in, in, in the text and I'll, I'll try to answer. Um, so now, perfect. A short overview of the DLT uh, sector in Switzerland. Okay, so short overview. So first thing, maybe why are we speaking about DLT sector in Switzerland? Why it is maybe known in the world? Um, I would say that first thing is that we are a country where even foreigners come to establish their companies. We sometimes have people based abroad that think about developing a new business related to DLT, and so they always make an assessment of which jurisdiction should be the better for this new activity, and um, sometimes they choose Switzerland. And so... That's because, of course, of the reputation of Switzerland uh, for uh, not only the talents, but also the legal framework, the security uh, and government. Of course, uh, we know that the government in Switzerland is quite supportive with uh, DLT businesses um, and has developed a quite detailed legal framework that is quite stable now that I will present you afterwards. Um, yeah, so we also have this talent pool with ecosystem. So we have a lot of people here based in Switzerland that now knows about technologies and etc. And we have a quite stable tax system uh, with, I would say, uh, not too high level rates of taxations. Um, so that's also, of course, interesting for people. Uh, so basically, that's the key success factors for Switzerland as um, a main place for DLT businesses. And so we do have this business ecosystem with universities on one side, the government and the regulator on the other side, the startups that provide the innovation. And then you have quite stable providers and partners that helps the startup to develop the businesses. So next slide, please. So that's a, a short overview of some actors in the DLT framework in Switzerland. Uh, it's, of course, not exhaustive, 
but we see that we have a, a, a quite a wide branch of actors in Switzerland going from crypto bands that really like Signum and Seba, if you know them, uh, to also some brokers. Uh, we also have uh, wallet providers and we also have in Switzerland some protocols uh, that are based uh, in Switzerland that base their foundation in Switzerland. Um, so we have a quite good range of uh, different type of companies with different objectives that can work together uh, and that, of course, enhance the, the business of the DLT in Switzerland. So now let's go to maybe the specificities of the Swiss legal framework. So first thing, um, maybe if you are not, uh, if you don't know how Switzerland works, we don't have a very long laws. And usually what we have, we have so the federal constitution that it's very high level. Then we have federal acts, so that's the laws. And uh, then we have ordinance, so laws that detail uh, the federal acts. And we also have uh, then some circulars and guidance from FINMA. FINMA, uh, if you see on, on the right side, FINMA is our financial market authority. Uh, it's the, FINMA has basically two purposes. One uh, is protecting the creditors and the investors uh, and also make sure that uh, the reputation and the competitiveness and the future viability of the Swiss financial sector is still in line. So that's the two main purposes of FINMA. And with these two purposes, uh, FINMA will grant the authorization to the actors in the financial sector. They will supervise them uh, on a high-level basis. But then on a day-to-day -day basis or yearly basis, we have audit firms like uh, PwC that will come into the company that will make the audit and then send the audit reports to FINMA. Uh, so that's basically how it works. Um, maybe to mention, even if uh, Switzerland is in the middle of the Euro European Union, we don't apply EU law, so we have... Swiss law with our own rules and we are not subject to European legislation. Um, so here in Switzerland, the regulatory framework started already since back in 2015. And uh, so it started to with some ideas of creating a fintech license that uh, I will talk about this fintech license later on, but it's a license that is um, specific or could be specific to uh, crypto assets. Then, basically, how it works, there is this really rule under Swiss law that is technology neutrality, meaning that we don't have different laws because you're coming from the DLT business sector or from the traditional banking sector. It's really same business, same rule, mm -hmm. same risk, same rules. And that's really something that is important uh, to understand about Swiss law. Then in 2017, uh, FINMA started with some guidance on ICOs, how they would treat ICOs, how would they regulate ICOs. Uh, we also had in 2019 uh, guidance on stablecoins, again, how to um, how stablecoins are authorized if authorization is needed in Switzerland and etc. And basically, uh, then we had uh, in 2020 uh, a new law that entered into force. This is the DLT Act. I will talk to you about the DLT Act uh, afterwards. And since then, we see a really growing number of actors in the DLT business that obtains authorization. We have, uh, like you see, uh, in 2019, you had banks. 2020, we had the first crypto dealers. We also had this fintech license. Uh, we have some crypto funds and uh, DLT exchanges. I will talk to you about those DLT exchanges. So we can really see from 2019 and onwards and uh, during the last years, uh, an increase of numbers of people um, active in the DLT business obtaining authorization from FINMA in Switzerland and being regulated uh, in Switzerland for their activities. So now if we move 
to uh, the next slide. So basically, we have a, a law that is usually called the DLT Act. So you may uh, have heard about the DLT Act, but actually the DLT Act itself is not a law that regulates, regulates uh, the DLT business-related activities. It's a law that actually makes changes to existing laws. So we don't work with a specific law only for DLT, but we rather inserted some specificities in the current legal framework. So with the DLT Act, we amended uh, on the first thing, the civil law. Uh, and civil law, why? Because we created a specific security uh, that is called a ledger-based security. It's really like traditional securities, but uh, they are based on, uh, on the DLT technology. So that's one thing. Um, so really in Switzerland, for example, if you are a company, you want to issue your shares, you can issue your shares in the form of ledger-based securities, meaning that you will have your shares that are um, registered on the blockchain and the transfer will happen on the blockchain. You will have rules that... Uh, will tell you when the transfer of the shares is performed, when it is perfected, how you can, for example, issue a guarantee and etc. And all that based on this civil law and the article that uh, regulates the ledger-based security. Then uh, we have the Debt Collection and Bankruptcy Act that has been amended to very make clear and ensure that if a company that is uh, active in the DLT business and that is actually having assets of client that is deposited with him, those assets will be segregated from the bankruptcy. So you ensure that the clients will be able to obtain against their bitcoins, Ethereum, whatever digital assets they had. And secondly, if they need some information to obtain, the, for example, the wallet, so if they need some access codes, uh, keys and etc. We also have under Swiss law the right to obtain the information from the company that is now in bankruptcy. Um, maybe you will see afterwards, but one important thing here is that uh, the assets are segregated if the debtor has undertaken to keep them available at all times. So that's uh, something legal that's in the contracts and that is usually always the case. And this happens even if the digital assets are pooled in a one account. So you have pool accounts versus individual accounts. So pool accounts is where a custodian will take the digital assets of various clients and put them in a single wallet, and it's in own wallet. And then, of course, that, that wallet provider or bank or whatever will of, of course have its ledger but it could be well an excel sheet that says that client a, a have 10 bitcoins client b have 15 bitcoins and etc so that's a pooled account and versus uh, individual accounts where you have an address a wallet by person and the differentiation is very important because if you have a pooled accounts, then you might need a banking license, uh, which is quite complicated to obtain, versus if you provide individual accounts, you will not need, in general, a banking license. So that's why the, the difference is very important. Then, like I told you, there is uh, these amendments of the Financial Market Inf Infrastructure Act, and this, uh, the Market Infrastructure Act was amended in a way that it created a new license for a DLT-based trading system. So it allows multi-trading for security, payment, and utility tokens. Uh, the trading platform can be accessible not only to professional investors, but also for private, for retail clients. Uh, the DLT-based trading system can deposit the assets and also have the clearing and settlement system. So it's a new license, and there is one uh, or maybe two now um, uh, companies in Switzerland that have obtained this license. So now if we move to the next slides. Thank you. 
So that's the last and main thing. Basically, the DLT Act provided some amendments of the financial laws. Uh, and the financial laws in Switzerland can be uh, summarized here, the ones that were impacted by this DLT Act. So uh, the first laws that were impacted are the ones that relate to collective investment schemes. Uh, so as there are some specific rules for um, manager of collective assets. Then we have, of course, uh, anti-money laundering acts with anti-money laundering activities uh, that may be applicable uh, to DLT um, actors. I, I will talk to you about the type of activities that you provide and which kind of license you need, but that will be later on the presentation. But yes, depending on the activities that you will be providing from Switzerland, you will need to comply with the AML rules in Switzerland. Then, like I mentioned, depending on the type of services that you provide, you may be subject to a banking license if you um, receive, for example, uh, digital assets for clients. And last uh, but not least, are all the securities regulation, meaning that uh, you might, for example, need to issue a prospectus or have your product registered. So that's the securities rules. So now if we move to the next slide, uh, so in Switzerland, like in most countries, I think I would say, um, there are three types of tokens. Uh, the differentiation between the three types of tokens is not mentioned in the DLT Act. This is actually based on a regulation that FINMA uh, has mm -hmm. issued. Um, so it may change and basically, uh, but uh, it's quite stable now, but um, it's not based on the law, but rather on practice. Uh, so we have three types of tokens, payment token, utility token or asset token. We also uh, call them investment token or security token. It's all the same thing. And uh, it's not, uh, you can have hybrid form. So a token could well be a utility and payment and even an asset token at the same time. So now if we move to the next slide and we see what is a payment token. So basically a payment token is a, pay, is a token that uh, allows you to pay something, to acquire things. So it's a mean of payment. Uh, the main example, of course, is Bitcoin or Ethereum. If you are considered as a payment token under Swiss law, you will be subject to AML. So you will need to uh, comply with AML rules and you will need to register yourself with a self-regulatory organization. It's an affiliation. It's not very complicated to obtain uh, if you are well organized uh, with people knowing about Swiss AML rules. It's not very complicated uh, mm -hmm. affiliation. But on the other side, you don't have any rules applying to security. So, for example, no prospectus. Now, if we move to the next slide with the utility token. Uh, that's slide uh, 13. Yes, perfect. So utility tokens are tokens that are intended, are intended to provide access digitally to an application or service by means of a blockchain-based infrastructure. That's a very, very long uh, definition to say that basically when you, are, you need that token to access a service that is uh, based on blockchain. The main and honestly, the only example that I have and that we have ever seen in our practice of utility tokens are usually these pre prepaid user fees. So basically, you uh, buy the tokens, then you can exchange them or give them to um, an actor in the DLT uh, business and they will provide the services. Either you can pay the services with the utility token or, for example, you will receive a discount. Uh, usually this is the kind of utility tokens that we see in practice. Um, utility tokens under Swiss law are not considered as securities. Uh, so you will not need to, for example, draft a prospectus, but they are not considered as securities. And you are neither subject to AML. So uh, basically, if you are able to classify your token as a utility token, 
um, you will not be subject to any regulation in Switzerland. And the last classification, yes, it's the asset token or security token. And uh, this one is the one that uh, usually represents an asset like debt or equity claim on the issuer. So once you receive a token, if you have a claim towards the issuer, then you are certainly a security token. Uh, for example, uh, of course, you, if you can receive dividends, if you receive interest, uh, mm -hmm. if you can receive a, whatever share in the future company earnings or future capital flows. So all that that allows you to have a claim towards the issuer. Uh, sometimes, but not always, uh, also uh, tokens that enable physical assets to be traded can be uh, considered as an um, asset token. Not always, but sometimes. If you are considered as an asset token, the good news is that you will not be subject to AMN provision under Swiss law. But on the other side, uh, you will be considered as a security. Uh, you will maybe need to issue a prospectus. And as you might know, there are a lot of exchanges that are not uh, authorized to uh, list securities on their exchange. So that's the issue if you, that's the main issue that we see with security tokens. So basically, if you look at slide 15, that's a, a summary of uh, payment and the consequences from an AML point of view, as well as from a securities law point of view. Uh, here, maybe one thing that is important to mention is that, and here that's why we made, we made two columns. Um, if you issue a token, uh, for example, it's a utility token that will allow you to pay for a certain service. If the service is not online already so you are selling something for the future so you promise something in the future then it will be considered as a security token because actually the service is not yet existing so here really uh, when issuing something make sure that what you are aiming at so if the the service that you, for example, you sell a utility token and you say with that utility token, you are able to access my platform and obtain XYZ services. If the XYZ services are not already there and you cannot offer them, then you are making actually a promise for a future. And so it's considered as a security under Swiss law. Okay, thank you. So if we move now, so that was basically on the, the I talked about the definition of the token itself and uh, the regulation that might apply if you issue that kind of tokens. Uh, but now I would have liked to present you maybe what happens to the, the service providers in the, depending on the type of services, which kind of licenses you will need. So it's not exhaustive, but um, it would cover, I would, I would imagine, the main services that you can offer. So first thing, wallet providers. So if you are based in Switzerland and you provide wallets, whether custodian or non-custodian wallets, this is not an, the, the main criteria in Switzerland, you will need to affiliate yourself to an SRO, meaning that you will need to be subject to AML and you will need to comply with AML. Um, if actually you assist in the transfer of cryptocurrencies and provided that you maintain a long-term business relationship with the contracting party. So basically, uh, once it, you create a wallet and you offer that wallet in Switzerland, you will certainly be subject to AML, even if you don't have access to the digital assets that are on the wallet. So even if you don't have power of disposal over the assets that are on the wallet, the mere fact of providing this, the service, the creating the wallet from Switzerland will subject you to a Swiss AML law. And here it's the second bullet point that is important is, and this is what I mentioned maybe before, you need to be careful when you provide wallets uh, not to be 
considered as uh, being a depositor. If if you are considered as a depositor and if the assets that are on the wallets are considered as deposited assets, then you will need a banking license, which is very complicated to obtain. That uh, requires a number of employees and uh, a, a quite high level capital requirements. So um, in order to ensure that you do not need a banking license, then you need to provide uh, wallets and offer wallets that are individual. So one wallet per client. And you don't have these pooled assets. Uh, so only really one wallet by client. Um, then we have the trading platforms. Um, we make the distinction between centralized trading platform and decentralized trading platforms. So uh, centralized trading platform are considered as financial intermediaries. You will be subject to AML and you will also certainly be subject to, depending on the type of services, maybe you will need this uh, new uh, DLT uh, platform authorization or maybe also as a securities firm. If you are a decentralized trading platform, uh, you might not be subject to AML. Maybe uh, here it's the opportunity for me to talk about uh, DeFi. For the moment, we don't have any specific law for DeFi and the, the regulator for the moment has not made any uh, official um, uh, guidelines on how DeFi actors should be treated under Swiss law. What we can see from our practice is that uh, FINMA, our regulator, will recognize real DeFi actors if the service is really not attached to anyone. So it's, if it's a real, completely real DeFi, then you might well not be regulated or not need a regulation under Swiss law. But uh, that to say that usually in all of the cases that we had for the moment, uh, FINMA was always trying actually to find a way to say that it was not fully defined, but there was an element of centralization. And because you had an element of centralization, then actually you were not fully defined. And because of this element of centralization, then you were subject to Swiss law. So... Um, Maybe that's a, a general comment about DeFi. It, it might come in the future with some further guidelines from uh, FINMA, but not yet. Then uh, currency exchange office. So if you exchange currency, sorry, can you go back to the slide 16? Perfect, thank you. So currency exchange, yes, uh, you will need to be uh, subject to AML and need to affiliate to an SRO. Uh, crypto funds are also subject to uh, Swiss uh, financial regulation. And finally, mining. Mining is not subject to uh, any financial regulation nor any other type of regulation. Um, you're not subject to AML, so mining from Switzerland is not regulated. Yeah, thank you. So if you can pass now to slide 17. Um, so that's the type of authorization you have in Switzerland. So the banking license that allows you actually to uh, accept deposit in excess of 100 million we, and any other crypto-based assets. Uh, we have this fintech license that is usually called like a small bank, a light bank. And so basically it's a, it allows you to accept public deposits of but only up until 100 million or uh, any amount of crypto-based assets, uh, provided that you don't uh, invest that assets and you don't uh, provide interest. So that's a quite limitative. Um, you, it limits actually the services that you can offer to your clients, but it's, of course, easier to obtain a fintech license than a banking license. Then we have the securities firm license, securities firms. Uh, we have three types of securities firm, client dealers, own account dealers, and market makers. Then we have a license for the manager of collective assets. So that's usually collective investment schemes, funds, uh, whether the fund is from Switzerland, from Luxembourg, from Cayman. 
if your company that is managing the assets of that fund is based in Switzerland, you will need a license in Switzerland. Again, here we have a, a, a sort of lighter license that is the portfolio manager license. So that's for manage, asset management for anything else that is not a fund. And uh, you also can use this portfolio manager license if the assets of the funds are below 100 million, uh, including leverage or 500 uh, million for unleveraged instruments. But the 500 million, uh, you also need to have some locking period. So basically, it's rather for um, for investment, for um, not for um, public funds, but uh, only for funds, uh, for private equity. I was looking for the word. So private equity funds uh, until 500 million. And then the last one is a very, and it's only a registration. So it's this client advisor registration. And this client advisor registration is needed if you provide investment advice, but without execution. So you don't have power of, of attorney over the bank account of your clients. And you will also need it if you offer financial instrument in Switzerland. Um, thank you. So if we can move now to slide 18, given maybe the time that I still have, I will not go into too much details with Mika. Uh, as I told you, Switzerland is not, uh, it's in the middle of the European Union, but it's not within the European Union and we don't apply EU law. MICA, uh, maybe you have heard about MICA, MICA is a EU law. So we will never apply in Switzerland MICA directly, but uh, MICA may have an impact. And so that's why we presented MICA here um, very shortly. So basically the purpose of MICA is uh, to regulate every crypto assets that were not currently regulated into the EU and to provide a single licensing regime across all member states. For the moment, some member states have some uh, licenses for certain type of crypto assets, not others. So the idea is to have a single regime all across EU and having this idea of passporting, meaning that you can obtain the license in one EU country, but are actually able to work in uh, the whole uh, European Union. If we move to slide 19, um, so basically with Mika, uh, the main thing is really the number one. It will, uh, it, it will create a license that is called a CASP, and this CASP uh, will be needed for uh, people, companies that provide certain services related to crypto assets from the EU. Once you obtain that license under an EU country, then you can passport it into the whole European Union. Now, if we move to the slide um, 20, the the type of crypto assets that are under MICA are utility tokens um, with more or less the same definition as the ones that uh, as the one that I presented you under Swiss law. The asset reference tokens, so that's basically the ones that track gold, stable coins, by, by crypto assets, etc. Um, diamonds, uh, asset reference token, for example, and etc. And then the last one is the e-money tokens uh, like USDT, USDC. So the one that has really the purpose of re replacing fiat currency. So these three types of tokens will now be subject to Mika uh, and be subject to a licensing in, uh, in the European Union. But if you move to the slide 21, perfect. Why am I talking to you uh, about Mika if I just told you that Switzerland is not applying EU law? It's because, of course, Switzerland is quite small. And uh, you can create your company here in Switzerland. You can make advertisement in Switzerland for your services. Um, you can hope that people uh, listen about your services and then comes to you uh, with this reverse solicitation rule, meaning that 
people comes to your company just because they have heard of your company, but without your company having making advertisement or marketing before. If you want to market uh, EU clients, EU clients meaning uh, a person that are based in the European Union, then uh, you even if you are based, even if you obtain the license in Switzerland, you might well need to also obtain this MICA license. Uh, and you will be able to obtain this MICA license only if you have some sort of of presence also in the in the European Union. It is everything about passporting and third parties country regime is not yet very 100% sure. Um, and it still needs to be regulated under EU, but most probably, most probably is that if you are a company based in Switzerland and you want to target European clients, then you will also need to have a presence uh, in the European Union for that. Now, if we move to the interaction with uh, FINMA. So um, FINMA, on the slide, perfect. So FINMA, uh, it's our Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority. FINMA is fully independent. Uh, it's an independent uh, from the institution. It's an independent body with its own board of director, own executive board, own employees, with a law that regulates how FINMA is uh, and must be organized. Then it's neither linked to the Swiss parliament nor to the government. Uh, the Swiss Parliament cannot issue directive on how FINMA should actually authorize one or other company. So um, FINMA is also, of course, subject to the law. So the Swiss Parliament can issue a new law, but they cannot issue directive to FINMA. And it's also financially independent. So it uh, levies fees from the um, companies that obtain an authorization from FINMA. Uh, so uh, it does not uh, need to have the money from uh, the government. So FINMA approach, uh, this is what I mentioned you. So it's this uh, principle-based regulation and technology, technology neutrality. So basically, it's the same risk, same role. So we don't have this specific framework for DLT actors, but they are subject to the same framework as the traditional actors. Competitive neutrality, meaning that uh, FINMA, if you comply with the requirements, even if your business maybe might not be successful in the future, this is not the problem of FINMA, but it's rather then it, it will be based on the success or failure. It's a, a matter of competition. So uh, there is no uh, me, there is no maximum of crypto banks that may be uh, authorized and etc. You can have as many actors as the market is able to uh, support. Um, within the FINMA, we have a FINMA FinTech test. So it's uh, basically a division of FINMA with very knowledgeable employees that knows about DLT that has not only the uh, financial background or legal background, but uh, they also have employees that have um, technological backgrounds. So they can really understand the technology and what is behind. So it's uh, it's really important. So uh, they can understand your business and you can have uh, a quite meaningful uh, discussion with them. About the discussion, um, we have these no action letters. This is maybe a specificity of Swiss law. So if you, for example, come to us, you present us a project, uh, in some cases, some instances, we will be able to tell you, you are certainly for sure subject to, uh, to AML, you will need this license, and so we can help you to obtain that license. Uh, on the other side, you can come also with a project, and we will tell you for sure you are not subject to any uh, financial law regulation, you don't need a license, you can start your business tomorrow. But usually what will happen to, um, is that you are in a gray zone, meaning that maybe you might be subject to a license, or maybe if you do it that way, you will be subject to license, but you, if you tweak it a bit, 
then you're not subject to a license. So you are under this gray zone. And with this gray zone, uh, what is um, uh, this non-action letter, it allows you to write to FINMA, to explain to FINMA your business plan. You make your own conclusion, saying that you are maybe only subject to AML, but not to banking license. And FINMA will confirm whether they agree with your interpretation or not. Um, those FINMA non-action letters cannot be based on a no-name business. You need to disclose your name. You need to, the name, for example, of the main stakeholders. So it, it must be named business. And of course, the decision of FINMA is only applicable to the facts as presented by FINMA. But if you implement the business that you have provided, do you have presented to FINMA, you will have a certainty that you will not be subject to any regulation in the future. So that's why sometimes some actors choose to go with this no action letter to gain certainty that their business plan is not subject to any regulation. And now if we move to our last slide, if you are subject to a regulation, then uh, to an authorization, sorry, you will need to obtain that authorization from FINMA. How does it work? Uh, usually first uh, there will be some discussion with your advisor with the definition of the scope of your services. Uh, then if necessary, if it's, uh, for example, a specific project, we can have preliminary discussion with FINMA, discuss with FINMA. And here, sometimes also on a no-name basis with the first discussion with FINMA. Um, then you will, uh, and if applicable, it's not mandatory for all type of license, but for example, for a banking license or for a securities firm license, you will first have a presentation with FINMA. So you will meet the regulators, you will present your project, and this will be the occasion for the regulator to actually ask some question, uh, tell you that maybe this kind of project, they will never be able to authorize them because of this, this and this. And so you can already tweak and change about your business plan. So that's the FINMA presentation. Uh, after the FINMA presentation, you will uh, prepare your application. Everything now is done electroni electronically. So we have a portal. Uh, that is called EHP portal, and everything is filed electronically uh, through that platform. And in some uh, circumstances, you might need to have an auditor that would look at your application. Again, for example, for banking um, and securities firm or, or collective asset manager license, you will need your application to be reviewed by an auditor. Um, and then you will be able to submit it to FINMA. And once you submit it to FINMA, then you have back and forth question with FINMA. Uh, again, during those back and forth question, uh, if uh, there are, for example, red flags, FINMA says this is not uh, possible to be authorized with this. It's not that FINMA will say we don't authorize you. They will tell you with that kind of setup, uh, we will not be able to authorize you. And so you have the, the, the possibility to change your setup, for example, change your organization, adapt your organization, and then at the end, obtain the license. Once you obtain this conditional license, then you implement the license requirements, and then you can go on the market. Um, so now in terms of conclusions, um, what I see uh, from our existing practice is that one of the good thing about Switzerland is that we have a legal framework that is quite stable already, uh, that is known. We have a practice uh, with a lot of actors that have been authorized and uh, we are not expecting any change in the future. Uh, the those are not going to change in the near future. So it's uh, it's stable. We have good discussion with the with the financial with FINMA. Uh, if I have to be honest, and maybe one, uh, maybe I I don't know uh, if it's really a decided, but it's true that we we are not known to be very fast. Meaning that FINMA 
might take some time, some months before answering. So that's maybe one of the disadvantages of uh, Switzerland, that it might be a bit slow uh, if compared to, to other non-European countries, but compared to other European countries, we, we are in, in, in the average. And so uh, that's um, basically my conclusion. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email, uh, drop me a small call, and I'll be ha happy to answer. Thank you very, very much for the presentation. It was a lot of content, but I think that you did like a super great job in explaining it uh, clear and easy. Uh, I just wanted to open the floor in case that someone has questions right now. If not, I have one for you, uh, and it's in regard to, to MECAR actually in Switzerland because you explain a little bit how it works uh, from inside to the outside. But can you explain yep. us a little bit about how or if you see or foresee any plan in the future for how the licenses can work? Meaning, if someone has a MECAR license and can operate in the European countries, do you see maybe in the future a possibility of an extension to Switzerland or it will mm -hmm. always require the process of creating a new license? Okay. So so, um, no, if you obtain a license uh, under this CASP license under MICA, and if you want to actually really uh, be based in Switzerland or, mark or, or have access to the Swiss markets, you will need a license. So that's for sure that Switzerland will never passport uh, European uh, authorization. And uh, as I mentioned, there is a very small, small, small chance that uh, that EU would recognize some sort of license in Switzerland, but the chances are almost e equal to zero, I would say, meaning that uh, actually, if you are authorized in Switzerland, you will also need an authorization in the EU. So, yeah, no passporting between both um, legislation. Thank you. Um, then last chance for everyone to make a question. Otherwise, you have the contacts and we always uh, tag the speaker on the YouTube uh, 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 video that is going to be uploaded. So if there is no more questions, thank you very much again for the presentation and for actually like giving us your time. And thank you everyone for joining uh, this session of Let's Talk About Regulation. Have a great afternoon, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.